Welcome to the podcast It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The ask a cycling coach podcast presented by trainer road. I'm coach Jonathan Lee. We have trainer road and Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Good morning. We have our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi everybody. And our CEO, Nate Pearson, who's smiling and it's making me nervous. <laughs> the difference between those two vibes, <laughs> Amber and Chad, there's a big difference. <laughs> it's like someone wants let's, to be let's here. Let's get this. Let's get this done. That someone is here. <laughs> someone is here. No, I love being here. I'm just, I'm just a very serious guy. <laughs> this is the truth. Uh, today, we're going to answer your questions about shaving and thermoregulation. In other words, does shaving help or hinder or have any effect on your body's ability to cool itself in evaporative cooling? We're going to talk about heat training and some specifics on it, how to find the minimum effective dose and how to catch yourself if you're doing the maximum effective dose. We're going to talk about some more stuff. It's all going to make you faster. So stay tuned. It's going to be awesome. We're also going to limit this week's podcast to an hour as an experiment. Uh, we... I was kind of surprised in the recent podcast survey that we did, not a lot of folks said that they wanted the podcast to be shorter, but we want to try it just the same. So if you like this hour, let us know and tell us because feedback is we're completely guided by your feedback on this podcast. So if you prefer it to be an hour, uh, let us know. I know Chad, Amber, and Nate and I would also prefer it be an hour too. So if you guys like this, uh, like but we'll do whatever you like. What will happen, John, is the feedback will be 50% two hours, 50% one hour. This is what we typically yep. see with things like and this. They will say, I will not listen unless you do one. So the Just key kidding. is to That's invite your friends to listen to the podcast, so then you can have more people that join your side, right, Nate? Have more people come yeah. over to the podcast. John, that is a genius idea. You should be in marketing. Hey, look at that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's all a plan. Uh, okay, let's get into Jeffrey's question. He says, Last week, you discussed evaporative cooling and microclimate as it, relate, as it relates to clothing. Uh, Chad, before we go any further, can you explain, explain microclimate in this context? Because we're not talking about like something that you would find on the earth. Um, what, is, what does he mean by microclimate before we go any further? Just the environment that's created by a layer of clothing and your skin. So the little space that exists between whatever's layered on top of your skin creates its own microclimate. Awesome. Thanks. So Jeffrey asks, can you provide any insight into evaporative cooling and leg shaving? I know, I know the most basic of questions, but I've spent considerable time on the bike with and without shaving and can, he says in quotes, feel, and he says a quantifiable difference. I would say like a perceptible difference. Cause I don't know if he's quantified it in one way or another, who knows, perhaps you have Jeffrey. Um, and then he says, read much better and faster cooling without hair. Thanks. So we talked about this one a little bit in the planning meeting here, but Chad, which direction do you want to take this one? Well, in, in order to save my need to share more details than is necessary on a topic, <laughs> since I don't get to do my deep dive this week, because we, we uh, decided yesterday, it's kind of a crammed week. So not a whole lot of planning time that there were a couple key questions that my deep dive wasn't answering. So you know, we tabled it for now. Hopefully we'll get back to it as soon as I answer those questions. So instead I dug into a topic, which doesn't really have a heck of a lot of research to offer. So Amazing. what you're in for Jeffrey, you don't have wild. any science. He does <laughs> not have any do. science to back this up. I do. I do. But <laughs> this is completely theoretical, speculative conjecture. And, and I actually looked up the word conjecture to make sure I was using it exactly right. Turns out it's defined as an opinion or conclusion formed on the basis of incomplete information. So hey. with, that, with, with that in mind, here we go. And, and I do I a lot of those. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're going to hear four of them today. So, so, so I looked at four studies and, and I know we're, we're going to make this fit in an hour. So I will be quick with these, but mm -hmm. let's go back to 2010. Coelho took, uh, and colleagues took 10 healthy males and they had them do two one hour trials at 50% of VO2 max not working real hard, but they did it under solar radiation, separated them by a couple of days, trail one, uh, sorry, trial one, they had a full head of hair and then trial two, they shaved their heads. So to totally shaved heads and okay, they measured environmental, <laughs> environmental heat stress, <laughs> heart rate, rectal temperature, skin temperature, head temperature, and importantly, global sweat rate. And what they found was that there was a lower sweat rate in the hair condition, which seems a bit counterintuitive to me. Uh, no different uh, differences elsewhere. And thus they concluded that head hair actually led to a lower sweat rate. So by extension, I contend that maybe if you shave your legs, your legs can sweat more easily. This improves leg thermoregulation. Maybe this carry over carries over and affects total body thermoregulation. Because I mean, if you think about it, the legs do generate a lot of heat. There's a lot of metabolism going on, a lot of muscle contraction going on. So, you know, th theoretically this is possible. 
So, so, it, so one vote for keeping him hairy at this point. It, 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 do you know if Chad, if it's possible that like the, the right, sweat, how do they measure the sweat rate? Were they measuring it like with how they've done in some certain studies where they actually just like use a patch that absorbs or was it um, one of the things where they measure you before and after to check weight? No, I think they actually collected the sweat itself. I can't remember because they didn't have any cooling on them. So I, I, I linked to the study. So if anyone wants all the gory details, uh, you're the master it. student. I got to collect your sweat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, for real. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> Someone had a pretty job. Yeah, because I'm wondering if like the the hair wicks the moisture, so to speak, in a certain way, like um, in the sense that if you are sweating on top of the head, then it pulls. I, I don't know. It's an hour long. Let's go. Like some- yeah, no, no, seriously. Sorry. Next <laughs> takeaway. Burn Sorry. minutes here, buddy. Sorry. Okay, so jump forward. 2021, Moto Rojas and, and, and colleagues looked at the efficacy and function of, and bear with me, feathers, hair, and glabrous skin. Glabrous is simply hairless in thermoregulatory strategies in domestic animals. And yes, we are talking about animals here, but I do believe there are particular parallel parallels that can be drawn. So, and I quote, hair is a physical barrier that intervenes in heat loss and heat retention. So, so initial takeaway, straightforward, hair does in fact play a part in thermoregulation. Okay, dense fur, and, and I keyed in on this because <laughs> Jeffrey seems to be concerned with how much heat his hair might be holding. So I'm, I'm imagining he has pretty hairy legs. I don't know. Sam. But let's pretend dense fur offers protection from the absorption of solar radiation. So through the skin, ah. right? So takeaway being is that the legs could overheat during especially hot and sunny rides. And this, I think we've all felt this, especially on climbs. So personal takeaway is that maybe climbers shouldn't save their legs. I don't know. It's a bit of a reach, but again, theoretical. It, so it moves it, forward. In layman's terms, like your body hair provides shade? Basically. Yeah. That's, okay. that's it. Solar radiation. So yeah, yeah. I guess shade. Yeah way to reduce it. So th- thicker coats, and, and again, Jeffrey, not sure what you're working with here, are actually related <laughs> to lower efficiency of evaporative heat loss. And this is the news to no one. We kind of covered this already, but hair is potentially another microclimate, just what we talked about. And, and, and it might be one that actually retains heat that your body is trying to offload. So yet another possibility. And then finally, in glabrous skin, so this is the hairless skin, thermal exchange occurs more quickly and it could challenge the ability to regulate your body temperature. So if you think a hot climb into a cool or a cold descent, maybe with less temperature swings, maybe less of these temperature swings happen if you have hair on your legs. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right, two more and these are quick. 2014 Romanovsky and call, or no, just Romanovsky looked at skin temperatures role in thermoregulation and noted that thermal signals from hairy skin actually provide feedback to our thermoregulatory systems. So, so we have these, huh. these deep, which are referred to as core and these more superficial, which are referred to as shell thermal effectors that actually do provide feedback, which can affect thermoneutral attainment. So, you know, we're talking wow. about the homeostatic core temperature, homeostatic muscle temperature, any challenge of thermal neutrality, we're trying to right that ship. So shaving your legs could potentially confuse your thermoregulatory system. And I know it's a stretch, but again, not working with a lot of info here. And then finally, Kambarov, 2015 genetic basis of variation in sweat gland and hair follicle density. And this one I do think has a bit of traction because if we look at the evolution of our ability to effectively cool during extreme or prolonged activity, it came about via two primary physiological evolutions, right? First, more sweat glands, and secondly, less body hair. However, the fact that that we or humans have have retained hair in a number of places, and I'm looking at you legs and and not evolved as many sweat glands in the same places, again, looking at you legs, it points to a certain logical outcome, right? That that we probably don't offload a lot of heat via our legs. At least evolution hasn't recognized this. Interesting. So maybe the legs are meant to be hairy. That's all I'm saying. Anecdotally, this is not the legs, but the hair. Don, we both shaved our heads. Chad, you shaved your head at one time in your life. When you shave your head, I did it in the winter once. And we I should turn just, that around. Just he had hair way. at one point in his life. Let's be real. <laughs> and then I, um, I walked outside in the winter and it was so freaking cold right away. Uh, mm-hmm. Amber, you have long hair. Have you ever had short hair? Mm-mm. Okay. Have you ever put your hair in a ponytail and up? To the, to the shaved you, head conversation. <laughs> in the summer, yeah, though, ponytail. you get hot and then you, you put it up and it's way yeah. cooler, right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. I know there's no science on that, but. There you go. Anecdotally, <laughs> there wasn't a got lot to... of science in what I just offered either. So we'll, we'll allow it. Next question. So don't wait, listen. wait, wait. Face, 
No, 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 not next question. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just Justin. imagining people's brains short circuiting right now, like thermoregulation, aerodynamics, thermoregulation, aerodynamics, and this is uh -huh. one of those classic, you know, examples of there's several feedback systems and factors at play here, mm. so there's never going to be one clear right answer. Aerodynamics. Hey, okay. that's the clear <laughs> answer. You're not. I mean, it's like what twenty watts or something when you're going fast. Yeah. You're not saving twenty watts of. Depending on, depending on, uh, as Chad was mentioning, the density of the fur uh, that you have it, going on on your legs. Yeah, it probably goes, if that stuff that Chad said fur. is correct, it goes opposite way, right? The denser you are, the slower you'll be because of aerodynamics, but then maybe you'll get hotter, but really. Maybe yeah, your fur is so dense, it just creates a new layer. Like, so it actually becomes less <laughs> turbulent. <laughs> I don't know. Hey. Aerodynamicists can help us. <laughs> it, the, <laughs> All I'm taking away from this is the word glabrous and how wonderful that is. I'm now going to describe word. my legs post shave as glabrous. That's uh... <laughs> newly glabrous. Skin. You're looking glabrous, John. Yeah, that's right. You go yeah. get on a group ride, just like yeah. my what glabrous legs you have. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'll get kicked Turn out. Turn out to get slapped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's like uh, in fifth grade when someone learns a new word and they come to school uh -huh. and they use it everywhere. Exactly. Oh, yeah. what glabrous legs you have! And everyone's like, every <laughs> every day I read the Merriam-Webster word of the day and I try so hard not to use it because I'm afraid that someone's going to call me out on it. Uh, look how smart you are. I read the same email. Well, everybody that's listening to this, go forth, glabrous. Um, we've already had some awesome interaction in the live chat as well on YouTube. Join us Thursdays at 8 a.m. Pacific. <clears throat> it's really easy to share it with your friends there. There's chapters. So you can scroll along and see what we're listening to. It's awesome. Maxine and Sean just do a fantastic job helping us with this. We appreciate it. Uh, Paul's question. And first of all, shave your legs for whatever reason you want to shave your legs. Now you possibly have another reason to shave your legs. We should say that before we leave. So um, I do it because I feel like it looks good and it feels good. I'm going to be real. So I'm not sure if it's actually any faster for me. Paul, heat training. I've read a few papers, but probably not as thoroughly as I could have, but I didn't have the answer to this in my readings. So uh, first of all, Paul, I don't know if you've listened to the Science of Getting Faster podcast with Dr. Chris Minson, but talk about a full walkthrough on heat training. It's wonderful to be able to talk to a researcher, one of the foremost researchers on this topic, and just ask him any and all questions, which is effectively what we did. It's wonderful. So listen to, listen to the Science of Getting Faster podcast if you haven't already. Well, if you have, I hope it helped you along your path. Uh, so Paul says when undergoing a heat training acclimation protocol, be it hot water immersion, no fan and lots of layers, sauna, one of the many methods, what is the minimum effective dose? What are the physiological tells that you have achieved that, uh, that you've achieved that day's end goal or that session's end goal. Then Paul mentions heat training carries risks because, it's a, because it is a completely different type of stress in your body and the repercussions of overdoing it are far more severe than just going 10 watts too hard on your tempo day. I played around a little bit with sweatshirt and no fan on the turbo and getting in a 40 degree run and that's Celsius. So really, really hot towards the latter half of the session. There's a very distinct perceived tipping point where my extremities could feel like they're inflating water balloons or my chest and shoulders feel like radiators. Sometimes it takes longer to get there uh, than other days. But once I hit that preceding feeling, I usually sit there for about 60 seconds and then cut it off. So are there studies, or he says, what the studies I've read don't tell me are the perceived feelings of the subjects that they have studied. I since have heard both John, Chad, and Nate experimenting with this at length. And what were your experiences? Each individual's tolerances for core temperature can vary by as much as two or three degrees Celsius. So rather than risk overdoing it with blindly following a linear progression study under certain conditions, how have you all judged the minimum effective dose to try and reap the benefits? Thanks very much for your consideration of this question. Hope you and everyone listening to the podcast has a fantastic day. Thanks, Paul. And on behalf uh, of everybody listening, thanks too. Paul sounds like my brother from another mother because he's like, <laughs> heat I aim for heat exhaustion every workout. Could I be overdoing it? <laughs> like, <laughs> once I hit that point, I'm about to pass out. That's when I stop. Uh, Ch Chad's a minimalist in many aspects in his life. And I would say that Nate is a maximalist in many aspects of his life. I am, I am a, yes, that's yes. a good way. I squeeze the lemon <laughs> all the way until it's just destroyed. <laughs> the rind crumbles. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I get the, yeah, the oil from the rind comes out. <laughs> yeah. But this is a great question, um, a logical one. I think that we have a good course correction for this too, that should really help you, Paul, um, in changing your perspective at this. But um, so he mentioned Paul in this one mentioned that the three of us have been working on this, but Amber, 
Uh, mm-hmm. you have worked on this clearly within a career of racing in brutal conditions, but then also you had experience doing this at UConn at university of Connecticut. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When, um, I raced unbound, I was doing some heat acclimation for that because we were predicting that the race day would be somewhere in the lower nineties Fahrenheit and very, very humid. So I was doing some heat acclimation training at the Corey Stringer Institute at UConn. Uh, Corey Stringer was a professional American football player who played, I think, six seasons of NFL uh, with the Minnesota Vikings. He passed away suddenly on the field from heat stroke uh, during practice. And the Corey Stringer Institute at UConn is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to research that prevents sudden death, especially as regards heat stroke. So they actually have a heat acclimation lab there. And I was able to go and work with some of the grad students um, to acclimate to the heat for that event and it was brutal but i will say that they were extremely careful and cautious about tracking core temperature like they had to be tracking it in real time and there were um a couple days where my core temp went a little bit too high and they were like instantly off the trainer out of the lab cool towels and i i honestly didn't even feel that bad at that point um which is a little bit scary because if it were up to me and it were just my own sensations i would have thought i was okay um but they they were like they just were not messing around so um we didn't have to go to extremes and there was it was there was nothing extreme about how i felt there was nothing extreme about the work i was doing and we were definitely not getting extreme in terms of core temperature um it was it was a just enough approach and not only that but they were very very careful to cap it uh just to make sure that we were doing this safely have you felt hotter than that moment when they pulled the plug, so to speak? Had you felt hotter than that in races? Oh yeah. Plenty of times. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's kind of like the, what you mentioned, their goal, they, they weren't trying to re like bring you to a boiling point <clears throat> and said it was right. about exposure to heat. Correct. Mm-hmm. And exactly. that's like a big shift and a change in this case, especially for, for, for Paul, you know, Chad, I don't know if you want to chime in because minimum effective dose is effectively your uh, trademark <clears throat> term. Uh, that's yours. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on this? It. And and oh, we can make it happen, Chad. <laughs> we can make it happen. <laughs> well, I, I kind of I, I look at things like this, and and training falls into this um, this uh, scale, I guess, or kind of a continuum where it really has two breakpoints. It's kind of like the whole polarized nonsense where you have a you have a threshold and then a gap and then another threshold so so these two thresholds basically and i said that these two Chad, thresholds basically Chad create poked a bear. three zones okay <laughs> right so so You're we have a break point we have a zone we have a break point we have a zone break point zone right so 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 two demarcations and then three three spots so up that that first break point is the minimal effective dose what's the least i can do to stimulate the adaptation i'm seeking and then the second break point would be like, we've used this term before, the maximum tolerable dosage, you know, beyond which it, you can't recover from it. So really you have that range within which to work. And, and, you know, really once you cross a minimal effective dose, you're good, you're in there. So, you know, question becomes why even push further than that? Well, you know, you can still gain a positive outcome by, by pushing up higher into that range approaching and sometimes exceeding that, that maximal tolerable dosage. You make that mistake, you learn from it. You don't do it again. You recognize I I set myself back because I did two workouts that were too hard, too close together. And I had to skip a day or two. And I probably went backwards a little bit during that time where it was necessary for me to, you know, accrue that extra recovery. Either way you, it was two steps forward, one step back sort of thing, rather than the two steps forward, rest, two steps forward, rest. Okay. So this is again, that, that range within which you can work, but when it comes to something that's potentially as dangerous as heat training, that maximum tolerable dosage is downright deadly. I mean, you can't push yourself to those extremes. So some places you can get away with it. Heat training, you absolutely cannot. Uh, Someone said in the chat that, um, maximal survivable dose. Is like my <laughs> mine and yours is a yeah. effective dose. It epitomizes uh, you, sure. <laughs> yeah, so you just got to basically what happens is your body gets exposed to it, and then you get rest some, and then you do it a few times, and then you start to get used to the heat. The, that's basically the the layman's way to think of it. That I think of it. And we talked to Dr. Minson. So I've done a lot of research on this. I'm not a, well. Yeah, I have done research on this to try to figure out what's the most time effective way I can be. I can do heat training. Um, for my races that are hot. And I've done it too before some cold races because we know that that actually makes you perform better in cold also, which is very interesting in that science of getting faster um, podcast. 
So what I like to do is I'll do my, my ride. Then at the, like the last mm, 10 minutes or something, or last five minutes of intervals, I turn off my fan and I start to get very, very hot. And then I go immediately into a sauna. I'm lucky enough to have a sauna. And then I would be in there for about 20 minutes. Sauna already preheated. You go in there, you start sweating. The, the way that I would tell that, um, like I would measure that I'm improvement was my sweat rate of when I got in the sauna, how quickly I would sweat. The first time, honestly, it would, it would take like to really get that dripping sweat, maybe 18, 19, 20 minutes, I'd get it. And then after I'd done this a while, it would be, I don't know, three, four, five minutes in. And I'd be like, drip, 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 drip. And that's your body's response of like, Hey, I know how to cool you now because you've, you've, you've shown me you can get hot so often that I know, I know how to cool you. We also know that, um, these things go away very quickly, but also it's easy to get them again. So it's, I think we, uh, Dr. Minson recommended about two weeks before three times a week, you could do this before like a key event or that part that you really want to be acclimated. Is that the right one? Acclimated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Acclimated. That's right. Um, and the other way is if you don't ha have, John brought this up yesterday and Dr. Minson said this in the podcast too. If you don't have a sauna, you do a very hot bath. Um, and keep your that, hands this... and feet inside, uh, mm -hmm. the spots where you vent heat effectively, keep them underneath, uh, the, the surface of the hot water. Side note, I've, I've seen a study before too, about holding really cold things in your hand, like ice, or, um, there's like, uh, there's other devices and stuff about this that really, really cools you. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've thought I actually talked to someone about this, about having the kind of like device while you're training inside where you could be your hands on something that's very cold. And that would be an extra layer of cooling in order to not be limited by uh, your, your overheating in your core. There were so some experiments good. where they actually used a little unit that you could put your hand in that, that cooled the hand. I don't think it ever made it to production, but they were using it for a while. Yeah, we, we tested this at uh, Stanford. Yeah, we did hmm. um, uh, a test. It was like a little device you stick your hand in. It has a gentle vacuum, so it's pulling a lot of blood into the palm where you can vent a lot of heat. And it would was very effective at dropping your core temperature quickly. And we did sets of pull-ups to failure, um, and it was fascinating. Hmm. It was, it was surprisingly effective. So Ironman athletes, like holding those cold sponges for a bit, or, uh, you know, like ice in your, in your hands, that would be an amazing thing. Um, and in the winter, when you're outside, when you don't have, you know, your hands get so cold and they're like, they're numb. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a reason for that. You can wear gloves and that can help too. So if you get in the, the tub, please, 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 please. If you feel lightheaded or, uh, woozy or anything, get out of the tub. Right. Yeah. This is the maximal survivable dose. Sauna like or on a bike, whatever you're doing. The tub's a little go, bit more dangerous. Easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You exactly. Got tub for sure. Yeah. <laughs> don't push yourself. You, so the whole point of this, and if I'm saying this, you know, it's true or, you know, <laughs> you know, I believe it at least I knew I believe it. You don't need to push yourself to that. Like maximum, maximum yeah. level. You just need to start sweating. That's like the, the big thing you need to be like, feel hot, but you don't need to feel like you're getting heat stroke. Do you guys yeah, recall yeah. If, if Dr. Minson gave us a duration? Was it like 20, 30, 20 to 30 minutes sessions? I believe it was 20 minutes, right? 20, yes. just 20? Yeah. yeah. And if I can, I want to read something from Dr. Minson that directly addresses the question. Uh, using a scale from zero to 10 with zero being entirely comfortable and 10 being the hottest and most miserable you can be, you want to be around a seven on that scale. That's talking about when you're doing your heat acclimation. So this is not getting to the point that in this case is being described by Paul where he feels like his arms are going to burst his chest mm -hmm. is like a radiator and that we know that feeling probably listening to this, you've had moments where riding or doing anything when you're just extremely hot, where you feel like this is dangerous. Like I'm, I'm in a bad place, hot. Um, mm -hmm. that is not where you're supposed to, to be. I would say that that would be a 10. Dr. Minson is saying that you want to be around a seven. So give yourself plenty of room before you get to that. And the whole point is exposure. So, right. and, and Nate actually brought this up in the science of getting faster podcast and, and, and focused on this point, but that if you haven't done heat training and you start doing heat training, you'll get these pretty rapid improvements. And then you'll hit a point of diminishing returns where just your focus goes to maintenance. And instead you're not going to see big improvements, but you'll just be maintaining that. So getting like, for example, let's just say that takes two weeks, which is roughly what Dr. Vincent has said, give yourself two weeks of acclimating to the heat with these, uh, this regular exposure of 20 to whatever, 20 to 45 minute sessions. You probably don't want to do anything longer than that. And once again, around a seven out of 10 in terms of uh, tolerating the heat. If you do that for two weeks, you'll get to the point where you're going to maintain after that two weeks. It's not like making the sessions longer or increasing your effort. 
or increasing the heat is going to actually bring about changes, you're, you're where you're adapted. That's the point. Mm -hmm. So your point isn't to cook yourself. Your point is just to expose yourself to, to hot conditions with consistency. That's where the change happens. Yeah. You've acclimated. There's nowhere, there's no further territory to explore or exploit. You're there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes logical sense, but you know, to, to just think more is better. That's what, and especially with Nate's logic, right? Being a maximalist, more must be better. And that's tempting for a lot of us, but it's just not the case. I love it. Nate and Chad are bringing balance to the force. No, to defend myself <laughs> is I search for the limit in a way that is, I don't do incremental. I do like a binary search kind of thing. It's like, let's fight, let's go over and let's go halfway in. And then that's a faster way to do a search. It's computer science. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> It is because if you find the limit, then you can back off and go halfway in between. You go halfway between that and halfway in between that. But if you do steps and it's the 400th step, it's very hard to find out where that sweet spot is. Mm. Mm-hmm. Somebody's saying something in the chat. They say, I see Nate doing blood flow restriction training in a hyperbaric or hypobaric sauna, followed by a hyperoxic recovery and compression boots. And yeah, that, that <laughs> Nate would probably have a few things to add. No, I've actually. done all of those. Yeah. Probably done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the hyperoxic, I tried to, <laughs> this is funny. Um, okay. Hour long. Tell it real fast. My CPAP yeah. <laughs> that, that, so you can set the pressure and the pressure on it at a higher pressure. It's like you're at lower uh, elevation, like sea level. And I was thinking, is that enough pressure? And I was trying to do the math just so I could wear my CPAP while I was training, have extra pressure and thus extra oxygen while I was training and have it be like a train low kind of thing. I'm like, I already have this device. I talked to somebody local uh, who's in the medical field. He's like, I had the same idea, but it wasn't enough pressure for it to work, yeah. I believe. Um, if anyone knows, let me know. But uh, I, I couldn't get it to pencil. So yes, that, wouldn't that be cool though? Like, I mean, yeah, that would be Optimized. awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shoot for it. Okay. Anything else on this one? Should we move on to Julia's question? Let's do it. <clears throat> okay. Julia says, howdy podcast host. I like the howdy, Julia. Um, <laughs> so this is my second year racing and first year giving enduro races ago. That being said last year, I always took the day prior to the race off the bike. Now I know better having raced two back-to-back cyclocross races at the end of last year. I performed way better at the end or way better on the second day, even though I kind of felt like trash. And that's when I learned what openers are and how they can be beneficial. So my assumption is that openers are beneficial across all cycling disciplines. But my question is mainly how they fit into the enduro discipline of racing, which we'll get to that likely at the end of what we'll talk about here with these questions. Then she asks, how do they differ from the openers I would do for cross country or cyclocross races, if at all? And what are some good short trainer road workouts to use as openers the day before an enduro race? Thanks for all you do and keep up the amazing work. Um, Chad, what's the goal of openers? I, I think we talked about this and it's, it's not entirely clear so much as it could be a psychological. There's certainly a physiological, there could be a, geez, a psychophysiological where, you know, you're trying to stay in touch with the pain and there may actually be endorphins and body chemicals involved in that. I, basically with our, our pre-discussion, I think we distilled it down to it's, it's something that works for some athletes and doesn't work for others. So if there's a distinct goal behind it, that implies that the people who don't do it are not achieving that goal. And I, and I don't think that's the case. I think openers work for some people and they don't work for others. I'm going to ask in the chat right now on YouTube, if people like openers, I'm going to make a poll. Um, boom. It's in there in the live chat. Let us know because I like doing openers, but Nate, you don't like doing openers. And neither do I. Yeah. Many reasons. So <clears throat> one, uh, I've, I've had that thought in my head. And sometimes I think some things in cycling are psychological where people say, if I can't do openers, I will not perform then in the race. Like they win the race. Like, I'm like, okay, it's maybe that's in your head too. A lot of the times my races are not in Reno and I have to travel. And there's usually so much stuff going on that day. And, uh, really, I just want to rest and chill before. And also I carb load, as y'all know, doing openers, you have to be careful on like, it will you lose or use glycogen. I believe, um, Dr. Pojagar put it on his Instagram where people did openers. Like they, they, they loaded and they did openers and they like depleted their glycogen storage. Like what they were, everything they were doing to carb load was now gone. So the benefit of whatever the opener was, was then gone because of that. And eating extra food on those carb load days is not possible for me. Um, another one is I'm also coming in usually fatigued to a race on purpose 
that extra day of like resting, like I can feel, especially with the carbs, I'll go from sore legs to like these, when I, when I go, when I carb load, I almost feel like puffy and strong. Like I flex them. They feel like they've gotten like 10% bigger and then maybe they have, right. Because of the extra glycogen, um, all of those make me feel that, it, that it's awesome. And then in the race, man, you get, I haven't done a ton of mountain bike racing, but for road races and crits and stuff, there's still, it doesn't ever hammer off where I really have to do a huge effort at the beginning. It, you know, I do the warm up and then I kind of, it kind of wakes me up inside the race and I, you can hide and stuff unless you want to do a first lap flyer or something. Uh, it's just, road racing, it has, yeah. yeah. And mountain biking that it's different. Um, totally. If, I mean, XC and short track, not marathon usually, but anyways, that's, that's, <laughs> unless uh, it's Cape Epic <laughs> five hours a day yet every day started like it was an XCO. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Amber, what about you Wait, across your racing? I can, I can imagine the life of a pro athlete being nothing but racing and openers. If you did like have a rule of like, always do openers. I really like openers. They work really well for me. Um, that said, I do them really different. Um, my, my approach to them changes depending on what's happening in context, because classically it depends, uh, in the middle of a stage race, for example, your energy consumption is so, so, so high that it doesn't make sense to add fatigue to that equation. On the other hand, it can feel really nice on say the day that there's a crit that's starting in the afternoon and you have a big wide open morning. I usually feel better in the crit that day if I go and do an easy coffee spin in the morning. So that would be kind of an opener in the sense that I'm not resting through that whole block from previous day's stage to an afternoon crit, but I'm not doing efforts to specifically open up the legs for the crit. So I'm, I'm trying to minimize fatigue while still having that nice feeling in my legs that I personally like, and that works for me with openers. When it comes to a one day event, I really like doing openers the day before, and this is more in the classical sense of doing some efforts. Um, and depending on how I feel, I might do some VO2 work. I might do some full gear sprints. If I'm feeling particularly fatigued and I don't want to add to that, I'll usually do a really light gear spin up. So super high cadence, um, where I'm not actually, you know, the torque I'm producing is coming directly from the cadence. It's not coming from the resistance of, of a bigger gear. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a lighter way. I'm not really loading the legs per se, but I'm getting them moving. I'm practicing that quick acceleration. And that usually feels really, really good for me, but that's something that I had to experiment with over the years and figure out. So I really had a good feel by the end of my career for what was going to serve me best on the day. And I've definitely had some really good performances where it was back-to-back -back race days where I went really deep one day and actually came back and performed really well the next day again. And I, I agree with Chad. I think that there's a big psychological component to that because on the first day, it's kind of like, oh, wow, I was able to go really deep. So then the next day I have this confidence that I can go that deep again, or possibly even deeper. Um, and I think that that's really valuable. A few things on that. First, <clears throat> if you do openers, don't do them with your friends. Or if you go outside, because if you're not the strongest <laughs> person or ego, agree. Uh, like this mm -hmm. has happened, you've done it with, um, uh, us national check Keegan, John, yeah. you've done it with Keegan and like, it's, it's oh, yeah. a and, different and thing. Pete too. I was thinking of Tulsa tough last year when we, before P Tulsa tough, the team came over to the house and everyone's like, yeah, let's go for a spin. And I was like, you guys go do you, I'm going to go do me because I have so many times made that mistake. It's really easy for openers to become a way bigger thing than they need to be. Uh, whether it's time duration or intensity. And I just went out and I just satisfied what I needed to do, which was just spin a bit and re-familiarize myself with what hard felt like. That's all. But I didn't want to uh, just waste time and spend, spend time burning down glycogen and accumulating yeah. fatigue. And the goal is, so I say that because they don't want you to go too hard. Um, the second part, I've also done better on a second day or back-to-back -back races um, in triathlon and road. And the the key though, is like, I felt better that even the second day I even felt better. But if I looked at my power numbers, I actually did not do as much power as that first day. Um, so if you, if you do have that feeling, use some data and say, okay, did I actually do better? Even though I felt better and I performed better, cause you might have a better outcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, and everyone else could be more tired and you, so just look at those, those things. And it's, I, I don't think I've ever gotten bigger power PRs on the second day, although I've, I've often performed better. And I think a lot of that too, on a stage race is because of my recovery and my, my eating ability in between stages. Do you think they, that it might also be because <clears throat> you're a little bit more tired? So you're being slightly more conservative and tactical in your mm -hmm. approach to the race. No, these are like all out things. I win like, uh, an all out minute effort to win. Uh, that's what I'm looking at. Those kind of power things, not like average power or 
or normalized okay. power or something like that. Just like, what is my peak sprint or whatever the yeah. move was. But that's a great consideration, Amber. I think Nate, you're a bit of, you're, you're a, you're different. You're unique. Like uh, your approach Aww. in the sense of <laughs> wonderful, Aww. Nate. Um, but your ability to just kind of pragmatically, per... <laughs> you're wonderful. Just kidding. Yeah. Just <laughs> uh, did I break up again? I can say it again. Um, the, <laughs> but your ability to pragmatically look at a race and look at, look, I have this much energy available. I have this. And I, in, and in terms of mentally getting myself ready, I just need to do that. And I don't need to do it on the bike. That's a bit unique. Like what you said, Amber, I think is really important. If you're trying to analyze, did this work for me or not? There's so many variables to consider and the way that you approach the race absolutely affects the outcome, the way that you approach nutrition recovery in between. So to just say, well, it was the openers or it wasn't the openers <clears throat> is really hard to do. Actually. It's like, you know, there's too many variables at play to just suss out that there was one thing that was different. One well, as, as Amber already spoke to that, there's all these contextual concerns. You have to frame it accordingly. I mean, if you've tapered really well and you're coming down to, you know, that maybe it's a, a Saturday race and you've had a rest day on Thursday and everything, all your ducks are in a row and you need something on Friday to, you know, it, it fits into everything you've done up until that point, by all means, you probably should do them anyway and just see you know, this is where you start to build that, that knowledge database. But if you're coming into it, you know, <clears throat> and you're just playing tired, but you feel obligated to do your openers, well, obviously be sensible. You, you, you're mm. probably going to, it's going to come a greater detriment. There, there's no real benefit to be had. Maybe there's a psychological side, but if you're running yourself down you wake up in the morning, you tow that line and you're carrying that additional fatigue into it, any psychological benefit that you may have incurred the day before it's gone. And now you have that extra fatigue you're going to have to work with. If you're heading into a race weekend, if you are heading into these back-to-backs that we just talked about, and, and I'm the same way, I do a really hard race and the next day, for whatever reason, I perform better, feel better. My, as Nate said, my numbers probably aren't there if I looked at them really closely, but I, I know what Julia is talking about. But if I know I'm heading into a back-to-back -back weekend like that, and I'm a little tired on that Friday, you can bet I'm going to skip the openers. I'd rather have that little extra bit of freshness, even if I have to reconjure it in the, the opening miles or kilometers of that day one race mm. on question how do i put this in my training plan at trainer road depending if i want openers or not it's amazing we built a feature for this in plan builder <laughs> when you build out your plan there's a little toggle switch and you can say add openers to my a and b races and boom it'll put it in there and what it will do is it will select workouts from the warm-up type uh, so we have these workout types and when you're searching through the workout library, you can check that box to say warmups. There's a handful in there. Feel free to customize that too within the cool part about plan builder. Now, when you check that box is that it will make it so that it leaves room for you to have whatever openers you want to have. It'll suggest one and you can pick ones. You can change it. Um, the one thing I just wanted to close with for me, at least personally, is I, uh, for me, it's almost all what Chad referenced earlier, which is possibly the term of being psychophysiological. It's like just familiarizing myself with what the effort is. And I'd prefer to call it instead of opening up the legs, like a lot of people do, I'm going to go do some openers, to open up the legs. It's to get my head, right. That's what I'm really trying to do personally with openers is just get my head into the space of racing and be ready for it. That might take five minutes. It might take 30 minutes, whatever it is. Uh, but it's really just, that's my focus when I do it. So my focus isn't exactly on power or anything else. And I think that brings us to the, um, the, there are two more questions we have to cover within this. Is, I want to say yeah. something about you, John. Yeah. Yeah. I think that John's head game. Okay. Is, is, I just thought of this. My head game is probably this big where in between here, I live where I don't go too far down. I don't go too far up when John gets in his mental fighting state, his ability to go so much higher and deeper than normal is crazy. But I also think, mm -hmm. I don't, you tell me, John, is there ability too that if you, if in the past and you're like, especially when you're younger, could you get the head game where it goes either way? Like it, oh, you could be sure. in a bad state and it goes way down your performance. Yeah. It's like my bandwidth is my, my, the, the handles are, are higher, right? Uh, exactly. Higher right. The, 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 the sine wave length or mm -hmm. whatever. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, Amp yeah. The amplitude yeah. is huge for John, yeah. uh, which is cool. So John does things to put himself in that state because he knows if he does, he's going to go so much deeper than usual. And I'm just like, mm, science, science, I got enough carbs. Let's go. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's, that's crazy. Uh, one of the things I ended up doing toward the end of my career was, um, kind of similar to what John said, I would just ride till I felt good. And I would ride how 
you know, I kind of felt that day. So like I said, sometimes I would be like, I really need some full gear sprints or I need to do some like real efforts and put the power down, or I just need to do some spin ups, spin ups or just ride easy. And I would literally just say, yep, I feel good. Okay. Time to go home. Or I'm not quite there yet. I need to do, you know, I might end up doing instead of 30 minutes, it might end up being 60 or 90 minutes, but never, never a big load. Um, and it's really, for me, it was more physiological. Like I wanted to ride until my legs felt good and that would help me get into a better head state. Um, but that's a really mm. good point, Jonathan. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm. Chat. I think you're going to say something. If not, well, I, no, I think, we, I think you're going to, we're still covering a little more on the same question. Yeah. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. this is the the point where you discuss, okay, so should I warm up differently for enduro than I would for a different type of format? Right. Chad, what would you say mm -hmm. to that? Well, I like what Amber just said. I mean, she just wrote till she felt good. She wasn't looking at what the race entailed uh, the subsequent days. She just wanted to get out there and feel good. And I think too many people fall into the rut of conflating their openers with the actual race warm up. I mean, the race warm up does benefit. There's plenty of evidence to support it that specificity that, you know, the types mm -hmm. of efforts you're going to do in that race, it's best you include those in your warm up. I mean, that that's pretty sound advice. However, the openers, we don't have actual research or if it's out there, I don't, I don't, I haven't read it to, to, to where they have to be tailored to match the demands of the race. There is, if you're going to have a, if you're going into a criterium, do you need to do warm up sprints the day before? Because physiologically, I mean, it's super easy to string together the fact that's not going to carry. It's not going to carry a full 24 hours. That's not how it works. This stuff is pretty short lived. Mm -hmm. So, it, <clears throat> again, like Amber said, you can, if you have to do openers, I think that's a good goal. Just ride till you feel good. Mm -hmm. Openers are not warm ups, warm ups are not openers. It's, mm -hmm. it's important to, to separate the two. Otherwise you do your warm up and then you spend 24 hours cooling down before your next warm up. <laughs> uh, I want to mention, I've spoken to Richie Rude at length about this uh, Enduro world champion about what he does on openers and warm ups because in Enduro you have these stages and the stages are usually very intense. It's sprinting as hard as you can repeatedly out of turns or in sections and dealing with crazy descents. Go onto our YouTube channel and you can see where I did the Enduro world series race here at North star and, Richie critiqued me and it's super cool to see, to see like a Jedi and how he's actually my favorites. Matrix. Yeah. It's so good. So cool. Um, but Rich, I asked Richie this question, like, do you warm up or do you do openers? Because I see a lot of amateurs before they would start, they'd be doing like little sprints and stuff. And he mentioned that in the case where you have a liaison or a transfer in between your stages, like you have to ride up to the start of stage one. He's like, no, at that point I've been riding and I'm warmed up. It's fine. I don't have to worry about it. And this is on warmups, not openers. Forgive me, I should clarify this. And then he said, when it gets to the point where sometimes you just start at the top of the mountain and it's stage one and you don't have anything, he said, in some cases he might do something, but even then he just gets his head in the spot where he says, I'm going to execute and I'm going to do well. Kind of like Nate's approach. Like um, rather than saying that if I don't have the ability to execute a perfect warmup, then I'm going to be off. Instead, it's just, no, I'm going to be on. And that's the headspace he puts himself in. In terms of openers, it's really just familiarizing yourself and getting comfortable. So even at the world champion level down to, and then to the professional long-term career professional, like Amber to average athletes here, you're getting a wide spectrum and all of them are saying ride until you feel comfortable, but definitely don't let it go too far. Really just yeah. try to be clear with your intention and accomplish that. So, um, any other questions that we want to answer with this one? I think we're good. Cool. Okay. This next one is from Ozzy. Uh, he says, Hey guys, absolutely love the podcast, either on YouTube or audio. Thanks for mentioning both. If you're on Spotify right now, share the podcast with your friends, hit the share button. It's super easy to do and rate the podcast five stars. Right now we are the top rated podcast on Spotify. There are people quickly on our wow. heels. Extend our gap. Thanks, so everybody. extend our gap. Yes. That's so amazing. Break jump the rubber in. band. Yes. <laughs> a pull through as, as cyclists would say, yeah, I'll pull through, <laughs> pull through, pull through, pull Take through and... turn. <laughs> and how do wait. I do this? Spotify. It's super easy. Search for, search for ask a cycling coach podcast or cycling podcast and you'll find it. And then if you go in, you can just hit rate and you can hit five stars. And as you rate us five stars, it pushes us up so that more cyclists find it. And that is entirely how we grow. We don't have investors. We don't have anything else. The way that we grow is by people discovering trainer road and signing up and giving it a shot. So 
that's why it's super important. And it's a zero cost thing for you other than a short amount of time. So please do it. And thus we hire more people do adaptive training, AFTP detection. There's a bunch of cool stuff coming. So please help. All you can do is exactly. Click. Yes. Okay. And you can rate it not just on Spotify, but on everything too. Spotify, iTunes, Google podcasts, whatever you do, please rate it. That would be hugely appreciated. Okay. Ozzy says, I do a lot of four to four and a half hour rides and mentions that roughly uh, they ride in this case, 65 miles, 5,000 feet of climbing and feel relatively comfortable doing them. I'm sore at the end, back and shoulder pain, shoulder pain mostly, but it's manageable. However, anything over that and my body takes a real beating, both in the final hour of the ride and the days following. Irrespective of how I varied the pace or played with feeling, my body feels feels destroyed. In light of this, I've promised to limit myself to 100K rides, about four hour fondos, but sometimes wonder if I could get my body to hold up for those extra 40 miles. Uh, could I make the hundo physic without physically destroying myself? So background, I ride an endurance bike. And what they mean by an endurance bike is they don't ride a bike made for crit racing. That's going to be really hunched over enduro or sorry, endurance bikes tend to have a higher top tube or a higher head tube and a bit more relaxed geometry. So comfortable is what they're getting at here. I have worked with three bike fitters, which usually you have to work through quite a few bike fitters to find a good fit. That's just how it goes. And then have been riding for a year. So that's not very long. That's the big thing that stands out to me instantly when I see this is that Ozzy riding for a year and already doing big rides. Um, so good on you, Ozzy for taking on big challenges like that, but that's kind of the main thing. Um, in my mind, I have kind of like a systems check of, you'd want to check your position. You'd want to check your pedaling technique. You'd want to check your strength and you'd want to check your nutrition. What other points would you want to consider Amber? <clears throat> well, the big ones that stand out to me are, um, pacing and gearing. And the reason I say this is, uh, this is one of the hardest things to learn as you get into cycling. And I say that as somebody who had a hard time learning this myself, and I've observed this a lot in other cyclists as well. Um, pacing on a really long ride requires you to begin so much easier than you think you need to. Um, when you're fresh mm. at the beginning of the ride, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Says the, sorry, that was my inner voice expressing itself. It always goes out too hard. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so on a training ride, if your goal is to ride longer than you normally do, you really do have to start out easier than you, you normally would. Um, and in that early part of the ride, that's a really difficult thing to do. And it requires a lot of discipline because you're the freshest at the beginning of the ride. So a wattage at the beginning of the ride, um, that feels really easy, that same power output can feel extremely difficult a few hours in or in that last hour of the ride. So you <laughs> really want to dial it back more than you think you need to, I'd say even for the first half of the ride. Um, so if you're used to riding four, four and a half hours, the pace that works for you on a four and a half hour ride is not going to work on a five or a six hour or seven hour ride. Absolutely not. And I've, I've worked with a lot of athletes of all different levels and experiences and backgrounds. Um, cause I've, I've done a lot of cycling camps over the years, coached and guided for a lot of big ones where we're doing big miles and we go slow, so much slower than you would expect, especially when it comes to early climbs. So if you're doing longer rides that have a lot of elevation gain, you really, really need to dial it back on those climbs to a point that you might feel is borderline silly. Um, but try it, you know, try doing a longer ride where you really sit at a much easier pace than you think that you need to for those first couple of hours and see how you feel in the second half of the ride. And you can make a deal with yourself that you can blow the doors off that ride in the last hour if you want to, but really put a governor on those first, the first half and just experiment with it. And then if you feel like, oh yeah, I was going way too slow and I can go so much harder in that last hour. Great, good for you, you've just learned something, but at least you're not gonna be dead on your feet when you get home. Um, I, I, and it's just, it's a, it's a big learning curve, but that's one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make is going too hard at the beginning of the ride, thinking that you can hold a similar pace for a longer ride than what you're used to, and then especially going too hard um, uphill. And then the second thing related to climbing on that is gearing. If you're gonna do a really long ride, especially early in the ride, pick the easiest possible gear that feels comfortable. So really go for the lighter gears in the, in the first half of the ride. If you're feeling up to it and you feel good enough at the end of the ride, you can hit those harder gears, but you don't wanna be unnecessarily taxing your legs um, in, the, in the first part of a long ride like that. And it can, 
especially if you're getting used to longer durations, you really want to be easy on your connective tissue. <laughs> it's just, mm. just, just be nice. You want it to be there for you in the, in the, the latter half of the ride and you want it to be there for you in the future. So, um, mm. just two things, pacing and gearing, I would say. Great tips. Chad, uh, what would you add to this? Yeah, so I initially didn't have a heck of a lot to add to it because that's exactly what I would have said. Um, I, I believe anyone that can do four to four and a half hour rides, especially as, as Ozzy states, a lot of four to four and a half hour rides can definitely extend that out an hour, two hours, three hours. You'd be surprised as long as you get your pacing right. And if you're doing a lot of climbing, you have appropriate gearing. Um, what I would add to that is he, he mentions or they mentioned that I varied the pace or played with feeling. Well, first off, that, that, that terminology worries me a bit. Played with the feeling. Can't really play with your feeling as, as I can certainly attest to because I've, I've run it into the ground enough times to know that if you're haphazard with your feeling, it's probably going to bite you, especially when you're pushing into four, five, six, seven hour rides. So you think you're getting your feeling right. And maybe initially you are, but if at any point you come untethered or you just kind of stop diligently tracking what you're putting into your body. Again, it's, it's going to come back on you in those latter hours, especially if you haven't paced it right, because you felt good and you were fueling properly in the earlier stages or phases of whatever the event is. And then uh, with respect to the team camps, I've been on enough teams over the years that I've been to more than a handful of first time team camps. And when you have a <laughs> bunch of new riders who are all trying to impress each other on the first day of a five or seven day camp, even if it's a three day camp, it's a nightmare. It's, it's absolutely awful because there's no right <laughs> answer. You can't, you can't not ride hard. You have to do what the strongest or, and maybe not even the strongest, but the people who are really getting after it, those first, really the first day. I mean, that, that really sets the tone for the whole thing, but you're, you're along for the rest of the ride, or at least until you aren't, I've had to bail out of a couple of those camps because I just buried myself on the first day, hobbled through days two and three, and then went home early with my tail between my legs. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, the thing that I think of with this too, is if you are not doing any of the basics, which I think is pacing and nutrition, those are the two big ones. If you're not doing any of those two bases, also, if your gearing is way out of whack and you've got like a little corn cob on the back and you're running like a, a 12, 21 or something, uh, and you've know, got school. like a 53. Yeah. That's going to be miserable too. But is if you are not pacing well and you're not feeling well, no matter what the ride is, it's just always going to end up feeling really, really hard at the end. And mm -hmm. one of the ways to, we talk about this a lot and with adaptive training, it focuses on this when you're every workout shouldn't bring you to your knees. Some days are supposed to be productive, achievable. Some days are supposed to be a stretch. It all depends. And as a result, you should, you, if you're aiming for a feeling after your training, in most cases, you shouldn't feel like you're drugged down. However, we, 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 as cyclists have this terrible habit of kind of like priding ourselves on finishing completely broken on a ride. And the problem with that is that it sets up bad grounds for subsequent training. It's really tough to be able to then train the next day effectively, train the next day effectively. And if you're dragging yourself down to the bottom for two weeks straight, it's going to make it so that it's going to be really tough to continue to improve. And honestly, one of the biggest things you can do with that, when you're talking about rides, not workouts, um, rides is pacing and with rides and workouts, it's fueling. It's making sure that you mm -hmm. do it right. If they, they're, I know that I'm just echoing what Amber said, but I want to put it in that context don't make it the goal to run yourself down. And in this case, Ozzy, I bet it's unnecessary to feel like this. I know that sounds strange, but it's unnecessary to feel like this. I bet since you've only had a year at doing this too, Ozzy, in this case, you've got so much like headroom that you are going to grow in this and get better with. And you'll yeah. look back and you go, Oh, it was a feeling mistake. Oh, it was a pacing mistake. I thought I was going easy, but turns out I wasn't Nate. Sorry. I bet I bet you already feel like you're a completely different cyclist than you were a year ago. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there on you, Nate. For well, sure. Please do. I can. <laughs> I, I the scoreboard is not equal. Okay, <laughs> three. Uh, I got three things for you, Ozzy. First, um, when you talk about that neck and, and back pain, I had the I've had that before. What fixed it for me? This is a hard thing to test, which was bar width. Everyone was like, "Hey, you're five eighteen. You got to have like really wide bars." And I went down from like a 46 to I think a 40. Yeah, I think I was riding 40s. Felt so much better to be narrow. Um, something with my neck length and my traps and stuff. But that on long rides was a savior for me. Um, it's also more arrow. Two, what you should do is 
we're going to, okay, we're going to go maximum effective dose. Cause what we're going to try to find out is, is this a nutrition issue? So what you're going to do before one of these four hour rides is for two days leading up, you're going to do 10 grams of carbohydrates uh, per kilogram of body weight for two days. You're going to get your protein in and you're going to limit um, fat for those two days because it's going to be really hard to eat this much. And the idea on that, so you're going to do that and out on your ride, you're going to do 90 grams an hour, two to one ratio of uh, uh, fruit, glucose to fructose, right? Yep. yep. Nailed it. Yeah. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to simulate what it would be in a race. So then you can do the same kind of pacing that you usually do. And if you feel way, way better, we know it's a nutrition issue. If you're still like hobbling and it's, it's awful, you can take nutrition out of it. Think about hydration too. That could be a huge one at the end of these rides to make you feel awful. Uh, the last one is you're year in, you're doing these four hour rides. You're doing a lot of them. Uh, I don't know what exactly you're doing, but don't forget to do intensity. Um, if you do some intervals and some 20 minute threshold, and hopefully you're using trainer road and we'll walk you all through that the amount of benefit that you will get, especially a year in that you'll just have your FTP skyrocket. And then having a, a bigger FTP, those long rides are so, so much easier because those, those times where you might be limited by gearing or everything else, um, they're just not as painful for you. And in, in general too, even if there's like the same percentage of, um, FTP, like the same intensity factor at a higher FTP, I can just do longer rides. And I don't know why that is. Cause you would think of Hey, maybe it should always be the same if you're, it's all relative to your FTP, but I can just go longer. Amber, has that been your experiences? Like as you're a more fit pro, well, your, yours is probably weird because you never stop training and yeah. you've always been like, <laughs> I'm no probably choice. a weird case, but I will <laughs> Five say to six it's, years much old. More, <laughs> yeah, it's much more enjoyable too. It's not only easier. You just, you, you have more headspace to take in the landscape and the scenery and have a conversation. Um, all of that just, it it helps. It's so much more fun. Like it's not just about fitness. It it's enables you to really enjoy it on a level that, um, yeah, as you get fitter and fitter, you just can enjoy it on a, a deeper and deeper level. Yeah. Assuming the pace is reasonable, every hill is going to hurt a bit less. Assuming the pace is mm -hmm. reasonable, every headwind mm -hmm. is going to hurt a bit less, uh, that sort of stuff. It, it just really does. It does help for sure. The, the last two points that I just want to make on strength and it's related to technique as well is Ozzy, if your, your body's probably going over the past year, it's been like, what in the world are you doing this cycling thing? I'm you're holding me in a weird position and for a really long time. And it's really uncomfortable. It takes time for your body to adapt, but strength, uh, undergoing core work and or trunk work as Chad has said, and, uh, and making sure that you're a strong body instead of just legs that can push pedals goes a long way on, on long rides. Uh, sorry for the word choice there, but it helps so much. Yeah, and, and so it's pretty basic stuff. It's not like you have to go out and do really complex movements. You go to our YouTube channel and you go to the trainer row blog. We have suggestions for strength training exercises that you can do. We even have a strength training calculator on the website that you can see to be like, okay, so here's some basic exercises and here's some benchmarks. If I can complete those benchmarks, I'm probably strong enough. I don't need to become some, you know, muscle, uh, muscle head at the gym or something like that. But that, that just, yeah. it helps a lot when you're just a bit stronger with your body and overall, instead of just legs, boy, it really helps with those final ones. And then that allows you to, um, hold better technique for longer. Chad, I've mentioned this ad nauseum, but Chad has fan he's fantastically planted and calm on his bike. Like there's not a lot of wasted movement. Uh, mm -hmm. he's just there and he's pedaling and it's strong and it's smooth. Weird. Yeah. And <laughs> everyone else is bobbing and there's a person that's like, uh, there's like the screen is frozen. He just doesn't yeah, he's move. a mannequin. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's because Chad uh, has spent years making sure that he's strong. And then he's also very disciplined. And if you use trainer road, you'll have pedaling technique drills to do and everything else that will guide you through this, but it's discipline. And it's that discipline with strength coupled will make it so that you haven't wasted energy for the first three hours of the ride. So that fourth hour, you'll be a whole lot fresher and capable of carrying. So Chad. I know we're, we're at the time limit, but I, I have a question. I just was thinking of this as John said it, a very basic one for like feeling better on the bike for long rides. I'm thinking mm -hmm. dips and some kind of upper trap work to help you through your necks and, and your neck and your, uh, traps. And the one that I've liked recently is it's like a lat pull down machine, but you have a bar, um, a very close grip 
<laughs> and you're pulling kind of high up to here and you got to really focus on your traps up to your chest. And, makes sense. Yeah. Up to your chest. Yeah. So I'm saying like right below yeah. your throat and you have to keep your elbows in when you pull and you can really feel it in your upper traps, uh, which is a limiter for me on long rides for sure. And um, time trials and stuff, a huge limit. Yeah. Well, two things, two simple things. Uh, one is body rows. So if you can just hang from a bar, mm. so just a, just a regular barbell on a, on a rack and you can position your feet lower than you, higher than you and, and affect the difficulty in doing so. But just those body rows where you, you basically look like you're in a reverse push-up position. You're just hanging from the bar with a straight, stiff body and you pull yourself up. You can vary your grip just, just as Nate described it there. So if you're on wide mountain bars, or wide, <laughs> wide mountain bike bars, and, and you're way out at the ends of those bars versus someone who rides you know, on, on the tops of their road bike, use those positions, at least if you plan to make torque in those positions. But what Nate just described, and you can, uh, on a plank, it can be pretty hard to, to work with wide hands. So you just vary your stance a bit, bend your knees, bring your feet under you. You can, you can tailor it such that you can do these things, but to customize yourselves with the, the muscular stress that comes with pulling on the bars in those specific positions. Um, and you can do it with a bar pull down too, but, but vary your grip, make your grip specific to what you're going to have to do on the bike. And then honestly, I Nate, those are good exercises, but I would rather people just started with a regular plank elbows and toes plank, because if you can't hold a plank, then you know, your body's deficient. And, and that can give you some direction on terms of what you have to, to work with, because that so closely emulates the position you're going to have to hold on a bike that if you can't do that on the floor for I dare say two minutes and two minutes is a long time to hold a plank, but unless you can bang out two minutes, you, you probably could do, oh man, that's when the whole field opens up of all the exercises that I would start to recommend. Start with a plank I, though, because if you can grow that plank to a couple minutes, it will change you in terms of how your posture or how your body feels at the end of a four hour ride. I can bang out two minutes. Um, but sure. on the, the plank, like what I, I was thinking you're going to be like 35 minutes because Chad with pull-ups, you're like, no, no, no. What was your pull-up number? I like think, 50? Like I think crazy? people under credit how tough planks are. So they think, <laughs> yeah, sure. Do a 30 second plank. I mean, if you've never planked before and, and you hold your body straight and you're, you're not sagging yeah. and 30 seconds can be a, a pretty tall order. So get up Two to the point where you achievable do, though. It is, it is. And I, I want to set a benchmark that's achievable. I don't want to completely, I don't, I don't want to say if you can't plank for 10 minutes, you're doing it wrong. Cause that's, yeah. that's a long time two minutes go from there. The, um, with deadlifts, that's another one that I would recommend too. That's been really helpful for me with lower back issues. It's really common to hear a cyclist say, Oh, at the end of the ride, lower back hurts. Deadlifts are helpful. Amber. I just, sorry. I know we're a little over an hour already, but I want to throw one more thing circling back to pacing. And I'm sorry. I just said circle back by the way. Um, getting back to pacing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I just want to mention, uh, one of the big things that my friend Janelle Spilker brought up when she was running camps was she would have phrases for friends. So if you are riding these longer rides with friends and you are concerned about pacing, talk to your friends, get on the same page with them ahead of time and really understand it's okay on a climb to just say, Hey, this pace is a little rich for my blood. I'm going to back it off. Yeah. practice doing that. And the more frequently you do that, the easier it gets. And it is genuinely okay. And you will probably find that at some point you'll do that early in the ride. And then you'll be the one who's actually feeling okay at the end of the ride when everybody else's tongue is dragging on the ground behind him. So I just want to mention that, that, that can be a bit of a psychological hurdle. Don't feel like you have to keep up with your friends. Just make a deal that you'll regroup at the top of climbs so that you can go the pace that you need to, in order to finish the ride strong. Yeah. Sound wisdom. Thanks, Amber. Thanks everybody for joining us this week. Uh, let us know how you like the one hour episode. Oh, one hour format. Nate, sorry, something else. I'm saying I some two improvements were reported inside the app or inside cool. the chat, and we have Sean is getting them and sending them to our CEO to make sure they're done. Uh, one is uh, the warm up and opener. The warm ups was not in the mobile app. That is oh, crazy. Oh, so we don't have a check. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so we need to do that. And then uh, Ian, let us know. Very good. Is that on the on the mobile app, when you go to edit a schedule, we only show the US uh, calendar format and not the UK because everywhere else we should have, or you know where it goes yeah. uh, in the more logical order instead of a US <laughs> where it goes <laughs> yes. days, months, years. Yeah, month year. um, yeah, exactly. So thank you for doing that. And uh, you can always reach out and just want to tell everyone, we always have to prioritize bugs, right? Because we have limited resources. Unless y'all rate us five stars, then it's unlimited. Um, <laughs> so we have to just look at things like that. But little things like this that are that are short and polished uh, are awesome. And still, the priority of the company is the outside workout levels. That sh- oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, um, 
can that's I cool. tell something that's happening for this? Yeah, yeah. That sure. we're putting in. Basically, uh, this is overtime. It's bonus time. <laughs> yes, yeah, bonus time. Um, I don't. No, I'm not going to say it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sounds good. Keep them. Keep so them I'll tell you later when it's launched. But uh, cool. You're not going to say it right now. All of our engineers yeah. just breathe a big sigh of relief. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, with that, congrats to Keegan Swenson for winning the first round of the Lifetime Grand Prix, smashing it. Yeah. Um, trainer Road athlete, the well, only how much does he win? Road athlete. What's that? <laughs> how much does he win if you get them all? It's a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar per prize purse, uh, evenly split between men and women, and I think it goes back really far. I think it goes back like twenty positions or something like that, maybe. Wow. Um, but doesn't the so winner get like a ton of money? I think so. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and it was fantastic listening to the broadcast because they were at Sea Otter and they were acting like it's like a real mountain bike course. And they were like, oh, of course the mountain bikers are going to do well today. That's why Sophia is up at the front. That's why Keegan and Russell are up at the front. That's why Alex Wilds, y'all get ready because they're that's not just, they're not at the front because it's a mountain bike race and Sea Otter is probably one of the least technical races you can do. So like it's welcome to, to just mm -hmm. real strong athletes. They're going to do fantastic at all the different events. So, but congrats, really exciting to see <clears throat> and go follow trainer road on Instagram. Uh, go follow us all over the place and go try trainer road, try out adaptive training. I want you to put us to the test and see if it works for the events that you have for the spring and summer. I guarantee you, you're going to get faster. So go to trainerroad.com, sign up, share it with your friends, share this podcast, rate the podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye.